Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of Paleozoic Life, focusing on the plants and the vertebrates. So at the end of the previous uh, presentation, we'd been talking about the uh, evolution of the seedless vascular plants and the gymnosperms during the Silurian and the Devonian. So now we're going to move on to the Carboniferous and the Permian. Now, the flora of the Carboniferous coal-forming swamps was dominated by seedless vascular plants. So from an environmental point of view, what we see in North America and Europe, especially during the Carboniferous, is we see large areas of the coastline becoming partially flooded, resulting in boggy or swampy environments. Now, at the same time, these coastal areas would have been located somewhere near the equator, so conditions would have been quite warm. So essentially, you would have had good weather, very wet conditions, and so it's going to be the perfect environment for the formation of large amounts of seedless vascular plants. In terms of the gymnosperms during this time period, we're going to see the gymnosperms both existing within these cold swamp formations, but they're also going to push out into the wider environments. So they're going to begin exploiting these, uh, essentially these more regular areas that don't have anywhere near as much water on the surface. So they're going to push out of these swampy locations. So the early Carboniferous flora was similar to that of the late Devonian, and it represented a period of continued evolutionary experimentation. Now this is especially true for the gymnosperms. So we're going to see them leaving these very swampy environments, and they're going to start pushing out into these drier areas. And of course, every time they come to new, a new environment, they're going to have to adapt to that environment, they're going to have to evolve, and so we're going to see the appearance of numerous new species. Now, by the late Carboniferous, the highly successful lycopods, also sometimes called the lycophytes, and the sphenopsids, uh, which is, and both of these groups are still around today, were by far and away the most important groups of plants within these coal-forming environments, these very boggy, very swampy uh, Carboniferous uh, areas along the coast. So the lycopods, which are a type of seedless vascular plant, appeared in the Devonian as small plants, but by the late Carboniferous, they were by far and away the dominant flora in the coal-forming swamps, and they could reach heights of up to 30 meters. So the lycopod trees consisted of a limb-free trunk with a few branches that had big palm-like leaves at the top, and they would have formed the upper canopy of these cold swamp environments. So. The design of the lycopod trees is very similar to the types of tree design that we have in modern rainforests. So in modern rainforests, the trees are packed very, very tightly together. And so if you want to get lots of sunlight, you have to be the tallest tree around because the tallest tree can obviously get above the other trees and it can, you know, therefore its canopy can get as much sunlight as possible. So being tall is quite a good advantage. At the same time, because the trees are so closely spaced together, it means the canopies are going to overlap. Now, this obviously means that not much sunlight actually makes it below the canopy. And so this is going to mean that really having branches that have leaves on them beneath the canopy is actually going to be a bit of a waste of energy because they're not going to receive that much sunlight. It's far smarter to put all of your branches and all of your leaves right at the top of the tree. That way it can you know, get the maximum amount of sunlight and therefore be as efficient as possible. Now, underneath the lycopods, we had uh, sphenopsids. These are also seedless vascular plants, but they only range in height from about five to six meters. Now, because they are beneath the canopy, they're going to be in an environment that has lower amounts of sunlight. And so in that situation, what you need is as many leaves as possible to try and catch as much of that sunlight as you can. So what we see with the sphenopsids is we see trees that have multiple branches and those trees and those branches are covered in as many leaves as they can possibly fit on. So beneath these sphenopsids, we have a thick ground cover of smaller seedless vascular plants and seed producing ferns, so gymnosperms. Now, although the lycopods dominated most of the, uh, the, the bigger uh, plant life within these coal forming swamps the largest of the plants that were actually around weren't actually seedless vascular plants it was actually a type of gymnosperm called uh, chordates and they could grow up to 50 meters in height so they were big but they weren't the dominant um, uh, they weren't the dominant tree in these coal forming swamps now, Glossopteris, which had a maximum height of about 30 meters, managed to cover a range of environments from swamps to temperate uh, environments, so essentially just regular soil conditions. 
So Glossopteris becomes one of the most successful plants that we see during this period. In fact, it, it starts to cover huge areas of, uh, of both Laurasia, Gondwana, and then of course eventually Pangaea. So it was actually one of the, uh, the fossils that was used by Wegener when he started to put together his model of plate tectonics. You know, so, of course, one of the things he looked at was the distribution of fossils and how that meant that the continents must have been you know, attached to each other to allow these plants to move from one location to another. So Glossopteris is a very, very common fossil from rocks of Cambrian and even Permian age. Now the, uh, sorry, I said Cambrian, I do apologize, I mean Carboniferous and also a Permian age. So the late Carboniferous floras are going to persist into the Permian, but once we're in the Permian, we are going to see a couple of changes that are going to make conditions a lot more challenging for these cold swamp uh, floras. So the first thing is, is as we transition from the Carboniferous into the Permian, the global climate as a whole becomes a bit hotter and a lot drier. And so this means that these, you know, these coastal, very uh, boggy locations, very swampy locations are going to start drying out. And so obviously that's going to be a major problem for the seedless vascular plants, especially living in those locations. At the same time, we also actually reduce the amount of available coastline because we formed the supercontinent of Pangaea by this point. So quite a lot of coastlines that would have existed earlier have essentially been lost. They've been destroyed as part of the process of bringing the continents together. And so what this is going to do is it's going to reduce the number of locations suitable for cold swamps. And so we're obviously going to see a substantial decline in the flora associated with these cold swamps because there's just few of them around. So by the end of the Permian, uh, Chordates has become extinct and the lycopods and the sphenopsids were limited to small creeping forms. So essentially you had gotten rid of these, you know, you know, these tree like versions, which were, you know, tens of meters in height. And essentially you had ended up with the more modern looking lycopods and sphenopsids that are, you know, typically tens of centimeters in height. Now, gymnosperms, uh, which had specializations for warmer, drier conditions, will actually begin to diversify in the Permian because they can you know, live with the changing climate. And you're actually going to see them begin to dominate the continental floras in the Triassic and the Jurassic. Now, of course, by the time you make it into the Cretaceous, you're going to see the appearance of the angiosperms. Those are the flowering plants. And at that point, unfortunately, the gymnosperms begin to begin to lose out a little bit. So let's start talking about the vertebrates. Now, when discussing the vertebrates, we need to begin with the chordates. That's the phylum chordata. So organisms that are part of the phylum chordata will, for at least part of their life cycle, possess a notochord and gill slits, or at least the capacity to develop gill slits. And in case you're wondering, yes, that does include human beings. So if we look up here, this top diagram is for a early jawless fish. So this is the kind of thing we would expect to have found in the oceans during the early and middle Cambrian. Now if we look we can see that there's a brown line running the length of this fish. Now this is the notochord. So the notochord is a rod made of cartilage-like material and it's going to act as a crude spinal column so it's going to help to keep the body rigid and it's going to act as a mounting point for muscle groups. Now, if we look directly above the notochord, you can see we have this yellow line here. This is going to be the nerve cord, also sometimes called the neural tube. And this is obviously where the nerves are going to be located that will transmit signals from the brain down the rest of the body. So in the case of human beings, of course, the nerve cord will eventually develop into our spinal column, whereas our notochord will eventually be reabsorbed by our body. And it's typically gone by about the age of three or four. Um, in terms of gill slits, when it comes to human beings and their development in, in, in embryonic form, uh, we do actually have the capacity to develop gills. So when we're developing in the womb, we do actually uh, develop uh, bone arches, which would act as the supports for gills if we develop them. However, instead of developing gills, what our bodies do is it takes those gill arches and it instead uses them to make bones for our inner ear, our jaw and our voice box. Now, in terms of vertebrates, vertebrates are actually a subphylum of chordata. So a vertebrate has what's referred to as a segmented backbone. So in, in our case, we have a spinal column that's made of vertebrae. 
Now, in terms of the early evolutionary history of the chordates and therefore the vertebrates, we actually have a bit of a problem. Fossils are relatively few and far between. And the main reason for this is, is the notochords and also these early vertebrates are going to be using materials like cartilage to make their skeletons. And of course, cartilage as an organic material will decompose. Compare that to something like, you know, calcium phosphate that our bones are made from or calcium carbonate that a, a seashell would be made from. Of course, those are far more robust minerals that will successfully fossilize given the right conditions. Now, this, of course, means that our fossil record for the early chordates and for the early vertebrates is relatively limited, and we always have to bear that in mind. So, as discussed, we therefore also have relatively little knowledge about the subphylum of chordates, which we call vertebrata. However, our record for subsequent steps is much better. So once the internal skeletons begin to become better developed, they become larger and they begin to be made of minerals which are more likely to successfully fossilize, our understanding of what's going on obviously gets better. Now, in terms of trying to work out where the chordates come from, it's tricky because as discussed, we have a relatively limited fossil record. However, what we can do is we can actually look at embryo development and give us, a, you know, to give us some clues as to our likely family ancestor and for like family ancestors. So if we look at the way that cells are divided within the embryos of vertebrates, we can see that they're organized in what's called a radial cleavage. So this means the cells in the embryos are stacked one on top of another. Now, this kind of organization is also displayed by the echinoderms. So that's the group of organisms that include starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. And this would suggest a common ancestor. Now, in contrast, other invertebrate species, so let's say something like mollusks or brachiopods, etc., use what's called a spiral cleavage when the cells are arranged as part of an embryo. And this means that the uh, cells in successive layers will be located in between the cells from the layers above and below. So if you want to see what I actually mean, look at this diagram over here. You can see here's one cell and you can see that it's located in between the two cells of the layer above. So you'll see there's a difference in the way the cells are being stacked. Now, it just so happens that when we actually compare echinoderms and chordates, we also see that there are similarities in the biochemistry of their muscle activity, blood proteins, and larval stages. So this would strongly suggest that the chordates are related to the echinoderms, and therefore, so are we. Okay, so obviously the first group of vertebrates that we're going to find are the fish. So the fish are the most primitive of all the vertebrates. Now the first, the first appearance of fish is a little bit uncertain. However, we have fossils of early fish from the lower Cambrian rocks of China. And they appear to show the development of what are referred to as protovertebrae. So if we look over here, we can actually see a fossil for one of these early fish. Now, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of this fish. I'm just going to be honest. Now, if we look at it, what can we see? Well, we can see over here on the left is going to be the head of the fish. So we can see the eye. We can see what would be the, the nasal capsule. So obviously here we have the, the fin on the back and we're moving towards the tail as we move over here towards the right. Now what, you'll, what you might just be able to see is you can see there are little spots located there, 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 there and there. So these are protovertebrae. So these are little chunky pieces of cartilage that are developing along the notochord. And so they're beginning to develop into a segmented spinal column. So it's not just one solid rod, it's now splitting into different units. Now this is important because having a spinal column that's segmented makes for easier movements. It means you can turn more tightly, it means you're just generally more flexible. And that's obviously going to be an evolutionary advantage when it comes to things like hunting or trying to escape predators. So it's thought that these early fish that begin to show the development of vertebrae are part of a class of jawless fish, which we call Agnatha. So we're certain that we definitely have vertebrate fish by the upper Cambrian because we have remains from a, a number of locations, one of those being the Deadwood Formation in Wyoming. 
So if we look here, we have a table of fish groups and when they first appeared. So if we look, we can see we have a, a range. So we have uh, the Agnatha, which we were just talking about. They make their first certain appearance in the late Cambrian, although we do have evidence which would suggest that they actually made their first appearance in the early Cambrian, and they're still around even now. So then we have the uh, Acanthidine. Well, they make their first appearance in the early Silurian, and they make it through to the Permian. We have the Placodermy. They make their first appearance in the late Silurian. They too make it through to the Permian. They are both extinct, obviously. And then we have two groups. We have the, have the cartilaginous fish. So that's the group of fish that will develop into sharks. And then we have the bony fish. And the bony fish will then split and develop into the ray-finned fish and the lobe-finned fish. And we're actually related to this group here, the lobe-finned fish. So this quite clearly shows you that the fish, or at least the vertebrates, made their first appearance with certainty in the late Cambrian, in all likelihood all the way back in the early Cambrian. And this diagram here is just summarizing what we wished, what we were just discussing above. To date, all known Cambrian Ordovician fish have come from near shore shelf sediments. So these are being deposited in coastal environments, typically where the water depth is going to be between about zero and 200 meters, and normally along passive continental margins. So these are the types of environments where life would have been at its most abundant during the Cambrian and the Ordovician. And therefore it makes sense for the fish to be located in those environments because that's where the greatest supply of food is going to be located. Now, in terms of freshwater fish, they don't make an appearance in the fossil record until the Silurian. So this later appearance would suggest that fish evolved in the oceans and then moved into freshwater environments. However, we are, you know, it doesn't definitively prove it. It strongly suggests it, but it's not complete proof. Now, the most primitive agnatha are a group of fish which are called the ostracoderms, and that means bony skin. And they're a group of armoured jawless fish that appear in the late Cambrian and they'll reach their peak in the Silurian and Devonian and then they'll die out. So if I just remove some of this text, you can begin to see what they look like. So they had this armoured skull and front body and then the rear of their body and their tail would be covered in essentially mineralised plates. So if you're wondering, by the way, what, the, what material this armour is made from, it's actually made from a mixture of dentine and enamel, the stuff that our teeth are made from. So, it, you know, it is a very, very robust type of armour. So the ostracoderms will have primarily fed on small pieces of food that they could suck off the seafloor, or possibly they may have ingested sediments and just extracted what organic material they could out of those. So they might have been a mixture of scavengers and... Um, sediment deposit feeders. Now, the problem with being a jawless fish is that they can only suck food into their mouth. If you really want to be more successful, what you need is something that gives you the capacity to actually, you know, catch food, take chunks out of it. So what you really need is a jaw. So the vertebrate jaw is an example of evolutionary repurposing. Now, research suggests that the jaw developed from the first two to four gill arches of jawless fish. So these gill arches are small supports which are made of bone or cartilage, and they keep the jawless fish mouth open, and they keep the gills separated. And obviously they're very, very important, because if they weren't there, there's a chance that the gills could collapse, and this would obviously mean the fish would suffocate. So more advanced jawless fish developed joints in their gill arches and this made the gill arches slightly flexible. And so this therefore allows the fish to partially or fully open and close its mouth. Now this is a big evolutionary step because you know, being able to do this allows the fish to actively pump water over its gills. And this is going to help to increase the oxygen intake of the fish. And of course, the more oxygen the fish is taking in, the bigger the fish can be. Now, the hinged gill arches would also have allowed the fish to pick up pieces of food that it may otherwise have been incapable of sucking up off the seafloor. So a good example would be something like a carcass of an animal that's died. Having a, you know, the capacity to open and close your mouth a bit would have allowed the fish to swim up to the carcass, essentially latch onto it, you know, make a, make a crude, you know, crudely bite it using this very, you know, 
early uh, open and closing mechanism and then obviously the fish can maybe have been able to pull pieces of meat off the carcass. Now to be clear we still don't have a jaw so the jaw as a feeding structure is going to follow very soon after the evolution of these hinged gill arches. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see the basic idea. So here is what, here are one of our jawless fish, and you can see these are the gill arches here that are supporting the gills. So they're helping to keep it open, and they're also keeping the mouth of the jawless fish open as well. So what we're going to see over time is we're going to see that these gill arches are going to become more and more developed. So we're going to see eventually these first two are disappearing here and you see the third one is developing into the upper and lower jaw and the fourth one is also going to develop into the lower jaw and also part of the upper jaw and skull. And so this is essentially is, as I said, a, a case of evolutionary repurposing. So you're taking an existing structure and you're turning it into something which can be used for a new use. So the first jawed fish is found in lower Silurian aged rocks, and it belongs to a class of fish which we call the acanthodines. So the, this is a group of small fish and they possess large spines on their back and you can see a picture right here. So they would all had these very, very large spines located along their back. They also had paired fins and they had scales over much of their body. They also had jaws, teeth and greatly reduced body armor. So they still had mineralized plates on their body but they didn't have the, the very, very heavy duty armor that were displayed by the ostracoderms. So the acanthodanes were most abundant in the Devonian and they begin to decline into the Carboniferous and then they die out during the Permian. Now they may be the ancestors of present day bony and cartilaginous fish. However, this hypothesis is far from proven. So, you know, just when you look at them, you think, well, yes, that looks like a fish. So you would naturally assume they are there for the ancestor for modern fish, but that's not 100% certain. And the reason for that is, is that there is actually another group of fish around at this time called the placoderms. And their name means plate skinned, and they are also going to evolve during the Silurian. So the placoderms are a group of heavily armored fish. And you can actually see a placoderm fossil here behind the text. Just to give you some idea, by the way, these bony plates that you could see in the largest examples of the placoderms could actually reach anywhere up to five centimeters in thickness. So these were pretty robust plates. Now they would have been a mixture of bone, so calcium phosphate. There would also have been some dentine and some enamel mixed in there as well. Now, in terms of where they lived, the placoderms uh, adapted to both salt and freshwater environments, and they ranged from relatively small bottom-dwelling fish, which would be centimeters in size, all the way up to massive predatory fish, which were between about 10 to 12 meters in length. The classic example of this is going to be uh, Dunkleosthesis, which is actually the fossil we can see behind here, which you know is, was quite clearly quite a uh, quite a big and quite a scary-looking animal. Now, one of the things this fossil is actually quite nice for is looking at the teeth. So what you'll notice here is the teeth are actually part of the jaw, so they're not separate like in our mouths. So if you look at what we've got here, you actually have a protrusion of jawbone, essentially, which is forming a crude tooth. So when jaws initially started forming, chances are the bones would not have been completely smooth. There would have been natural undulations along the surface. Now, obviously, when you bite down on something, these undulations are going to focus the pressure right at the tip, right at the point. Now, what this is going to mean is obviously that means you get that high pressure area, and that means this, this can be used essentially to slice through material like meat. And so what's going to happen is that's obviously going to be an evolutionary advantage because it's going to mean you can bite down on stuff more efficiently. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see the development of teeth from these undulations in the jawbone. And over time, they're going to become more and more accentuated to make them more and more efficient at cutting. And so this essentially is one of the routes that's going to take us to teeth in general. Now, in terms of the placoderms and why we think they are so important and you know, why we think they're related to us, well, it all falls on a fossil from China from the late Silurian. Now, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name because I'll just get it wrong. Now, this particular fish is important because when we look at the jaw design, it's actually very similar to modern day bony fish and land dwelling animals, including ourselves.
Now, so if we look at our draw and we compare it to something like an acanthidine draw, there are similarities. However, there are also noticeable differences. Now, if we compare the jaws of bony fish and land-dwelling animals, including us, to this late Silurian placoderm, on the other hand, we can look at the jaws and we can say, these look pretty similar to each other. This would suggest that there is a chance that we might be related to this group of fish. So the fossil suggests that it is the common ancestor which sits between cartilaginous fish, so that's the sharks, and bony fish. So that's what this jaw design is suggesting to us, and obviously we are um, evolved from bony fish. So interestingly, its relationship to the other placoderms, though, is actually uncertain, and this is one of the problems we have. It's an individual fossil. We don't, we, you know, we don't have a, you know, an, an evolutionary chain of fossils before it and after it, so we can see where it fits into the sequence. So this is why we can't be certain whether it's actually related to us and how it fits into the placoderm group in general. It does seem to be slightly anomalous, and so we have to treat it quite carefully. So if we just get rid of the text here, you can see. So this is the, uh, the, the fossil for the head of Dunkleosteus, and just look at the size of these armoured plates, and look at these teeth. They're fearsome. Would have been quite the predatory animal. So, as well as the ostracoderms and the acanthodanes and the placoderms, the Devonian also saw the first appearance of the cartilaginous and bony fish. So, the cartilaginous fish are a group of fish that appear in the early Devonian, and they're represented in the modern, for, uh, modern fauna by sharks, rays, and skates. So, by the late Devonian, we actually have the first primitive sharks making their appearance. Now, cartilaginous fish are, on the whole, rarer than their bony equivalents. So, the bony fish also appeared in the early Devonian. Now, as they make up the majority of fish and amphibians evolve from them, they are obviously exceptionally important from an evolutionary point of view, because obviously the fish give rise to the amphibians, the amphibians give rise to the reptiles, and the reptiles give rise to the birds and the mammals. So, bony fish consist of two groups, the ray-finned fish and the lobe-finned fish. So, ray-finned fish have fins which are supported by fine bony spines. So, if we look over here, we can see an example of a ray-finned fish fin. So, what you can see is, here's the fin, and you can see it's supported by these fine bony supports. These are called rays, hence the name ray-finned fish. And these rays help to keep the fin open. Now, the ray-finned fish... Uh, live in both saline and freshwater environments, and they comprise about 99% of all the 30,000 or so known species of fish. So they're an extremely successful group. Now, the other group, and arguably the group we're more interested in, are the lobe-finned fish. So lobe-finned fish fins essentially are joined to the body by a single bone. The lobe-finned fish fins are also considerably more muscular. So if we look at this lobe-finned fish fin here, you can see just how much more robustly built it is when you compare it to a ray-finned fish fin. So the first thing is it's obviously a lot more muscular. Now, obviously, if it's a lot more muscular, that means you need to have good solid bones for those muscles to be attached to. So it means the bone structure inside here must also be a lot larger and a lot more robust. In terms of the bone structure itself, the limb will be attached to the body by a single bone. Now, think of a human skeleton as a good comparison. So let's think of our arms. Well, our arms are joined to our body by a single bone, the humerus. In the case of our legs, they're joined to our pelvis by a single bone, the femur. So you can see there's already a similarity here. So uh, in the case of lobe fin fish, the pectoral, which are the front fins, and the pelvic, which are the back fins, have articulations resembling tetrapod limbs. So a tetrapod limb essentially is the limb of a four-legged animal. So think amphibians, think reptiles. So if we come over here, we can see a simplified diagram that's showing you what we're talking about. So here's a simplified lobe-finned fish limb. So if you look here, here's that single bone that's joining it to the torso. Then we have the yellow bones here, and then we have this area of red bones. So let's think of the human arm as a, as a good comparison here. So in the case of a human arm, this upper bone in blue would be our humerus. So then we would have the two lower arm bones, which are the radius and the ulna. And then we would have these bones, which are marked out here in red, which would be the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, the wrist bones, the palm bones, and the finger bones. 
And so we can see the same thing over here in this tetrapod limb. So this is the same kind of thing you would get associated with animals like amphibians and reptiles. So you would have one single bone joining the limb to the to the torso, you would have these two lower bones, and then you would have the wrist bones, the palm bones, and the finger bones, the phalanges. So what you can see here is that there are good similarities between the lobe finned fish fins and tetrapod limbs, and, therefore, and we also know that the tetrapods, the amphibians, and the reptiles will eventually give rise to the mammals, of which we are obviously a member. And so you can see that there is a good solid bank of evidence already building up to suggest that the tetrapods, the mammals, are related to the lobe finned fish. So in terms of lobe finned fish, they have two main orders. The first order are the celiacamps, also sometimes called the celiacamphomorpha. Now, this is a group of fish that live in oceans, and they tend to live in quite deep water. And we've actually come across them before because they're one of these organisms which we call a living fossil. They haven't really changed much for hundreds of millions of years. Now, if we look at one over here, here actually is a celiacanth uh, model, this is, but this is what a celiacanth fish looks like. And you can see there it is again. There's that very, very muscular pectoral fin and here we have this very very muscular uh, pelvic fin back here so forelimb and hindlimb in terms of the other group they are the lungfish or the uh, ripidistia and in the case of the lungfish they've developed a very particular technique and they need it because of the types of environment in which they live in so lungfish on the whole live in freshwater environments and unfortunately sometimes your freshwater environment will dry out. Your river gets dry, your lake gets dry and it disappears. Now for most fish of course that would be the end because without the water they can't breathe, they would die. But what the lungfish have gone and done is they've gone and adapted their swim bladder to allow them to uh, breathe in air. So the swim bladder is a part of the internal structure of a fish. Now it's designed to help the fish go up and down in the water. So if the fish pumps air into the swim bladder, the fish will become more buoyant and it will rise in the water. If the fish wants to go down in the water, it will pump air out of the swim bladder. The fish will therefore become less buoyant and it will sink. So that's what it's used for when the fish are actually in water. However, the lungfish have come up with a method that allows them to breathe in air and put it into the swim bladder. And so what happens then is some of the oxygen in that air will then essentially uh, move through the, uh, through the skin of the swim bladder into the blood vessels behind. And so it will allow oxygen to enter the fish's bloodstream. Now this means that the lungfish can breathe air. So if their river or lake dries out, they have a few options. They can either try and find a new body of water in which to live, or they can stay in the body of water that they're in. And what they'll do is they'll essentially bury themselves down in the mud and they'll just wait there until the rain fills, until rain fills the river or the lake back up. And of course they can do both of these things because they can breathe the air. Lungfish are also helped by the fact that they have these very muscular, essentially pectoral and pelvic fins, and they can actually use them to drag themselves across the ground to try and find a new body of water. They're also very, very useful when trying to bury yourself in mud for protection. So as you can see, the, the, the lungfish are the group from which we are going to evolve. So the Ripidistian fish, which are a group which includes the lungfish, make their first appearance in the Devonian. On the whole, they're mostly freshwater fish and they're normally predatory. They can be anywhere up to two meters in length and based on what we can see, they appear to be the ancestral group for the amphibians. So the uh, Ripidistians are actually gonna give rise to a, a group called the Tetrapodomorpha or the Tetrapodomorphian fish. So the group Tetrapodomorpha is a very, very large group. So it includes these tetrapod-like fish. It includes amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. So it's a huge group of animals. But right at the base of the Tetrapodomorpha are these tetrapod-like fish. Now, these tetrapod-like fish have very elongate bodies and they have big, powerful fins, just like we've been you know, discussing for the lobe-finned fish. And it would seem that in some cases, these fins could probably have been sufficient to have actually propelled the animal over land. 
So if we look at an example of one of these types of organisms, this is a Queensland lungfish, and you can quite clearly see here what we have is we have a fish. Now it's a lungfish, so it can survive in you know in the open air, and you can see that it has these big, powerful pectoral and pelvic fins, which are sufficient in theory to pull it over the open ground if it needs to, or it can use them to bury itself if it wants to try and protect itself, you know, in in mud. Now, the structural similarities between these tetrapodomorphian fish and the early amphibians is very, very clear. So there's the general body design. So if we look here, we have one of these early fish here, and here we have a very early amphibian. You can see similarities, for instance, in the skull shape, very flat, very broad skull with eyes located on the top. You can also see similarities in terms of the positioning of the pectoral and the pelvic limbs. In terms of the limb design, we've already discussed how we have similarities in the bone articulations. So we can look at the limbs of these tetra, uh, tetrapodomorphian fish and we can compare them to, to the early amphibians and we can see bones like the humerus, the radius and ulna and the carpals, metacarpals and phalanges which make the wrist, the palm and the fingers. And on top of that, we also have similarities in tooth design as well. And so all these pieces of evidence together are very, very strong indicators that the amphibians are directly descended from the tetrapodomorphian fish. OK, so this is a good place to stop part two. So please get up, have a walk around, get a glass of water, take five or ten minutes to relax, and then please come back for part three.